Hey gang, today we're going to talk about slavery in America. And this podcast, podcast, whatever, flip lecture is going to take us all the way through to modern times, kind of so that we can look at the legacy of slavery in American history. So we're learning some hard history here at this point. Um, here we go. So slavery was introduced into the Americas pretty much as soon as colonization happened. We know it started in Latin America with the encomienda system and the attempt to enslave Native Americans, which wasn't very successful. But here in the North America continent, you see the first slaves mentioned and brought in in August of 1619. Um, the only thing that lets us know that there were slaves aboard that ship was that there was captive cargo of not anything but 20 or odd neg Negroes. Um, and so we know that those folks came and soon after we saw more and more arriving in the colonies. Very quickly, you also have laws being passed by colonial legislatures to regulate these new people coming to the continent. Um, as early as the 1650s. And these were known as slave codes and these regulated the behavior of slaves and just defined the rights and responsibilities of slave owners. So you have this court ruling um, between Anthony Johnson and his servant in 1655 that ruled in favor of Anthony Johnson, who was a free man of African descent when he was accused of keeping an indentured servant as a slave. So early you see well maybe slaves could actually have indentured servants and they had some rights but then um later within 10 years even you see um that these get more restrictive whereas some doubts have arisen whether children got by an englishman among upon a negro woman should be slave or free be it therefore enacted and declared by this present grand assembly that all children born in this country shall be held bond or free according to the condition of their mother um, so if your mother, which it was hard to disprove who you was your mother, but it was very easy to disprove who was your father. So it was the condition of your mother that determined whether or not you were slave or free. As we get into the revolutionary period, you're seeing, um, the British who actively are recruiting enslaved black men and giving them the promise of freedom if the British won the revolution. Um, so you got several or quite a few African Americans siding with the Loyalists and the British. However, when they would be recaptured, they would be re-enslaved. The first person killed in the Boston Massacre was the slave Crispus Attucks. It's still kind of unclear what his role was in that event. During the revolutionary period and the post-revolutionary period, um, the founders actually incorporated protections of slavery in the actual constitution. So articles one, four, and five actually address slavery specifically. Article one talks about the three-fifths clause, which counted three-fifths of the slave population to, to determine whether or not um, that could increase a state's representation in the House of Representatives. It also counted a head tax to be levied on states that had slaves. And that tax gets um, mentioned again in two other parts of Article One. It also said that the slave trade clause would be prohibited. Um, Congress would not be able to ban the international slave trade before 1808. Article Four is the Fugitive Slave Clause, which basically says slaves have to be returned to their masters. And Article 5 prohibited an amendment to either the taxation or the slave trade clauses. Um, so they're really setting us up for divisiveness on this matter and ensuring that the institution of slavery is ingrained in our economy. So slavery, however, in the constitutional period was not exclusive to the South. Slavery was growing nationally. Um, you also saw slaves in the North. Um, but as we get to the late 1700s, early 1800s, 
um, 1800s, you're starting to see that shift to match the geography of plantations. And so by 1860, which is the opening of the Civil War, you see most of the slaves being held in the South, particularly in the Deep South. So what causes this expansion of slavery um, from the early 1800s to the um, 1850s? Uh, Congress actually ends the legal participation in the international slave trade, but our internet, or our, not our international, our domestic market expanded. We had 1.2 million men and women in the upper South that were forced to move into the black belt during that time period. This is known as the second middle passage. You have families that are being torn apart sold and um, there were it was really hard to maintain familial ties. Um, men in their mid-20s were most valuable because they were strong and could do the heavy labor of um, plantation farming. And also we saw a reinforcement of racial stereotypes. The more dark-skinned a person was, they would be given the hardest work. And the lighter-skinned slaves were allowed to do household works and, and act as personal servants in homes most often. Um, the United States has this complex economic structure that revolves entirely around slavery um, that incur it occurred and included insurance companies, auction houses. Um, you could get loans to buy slaves. You could mortgage your house to buy slaves. Um, and you could use slaves as collateral to get loans to buy more property. So you can see this reiterated again with this spread of slavery from um, 1790 to 1860. So here are some auction houses that were in many towns, particularly port towns. You would see advertisements, people selling or willing to buy or looking to buy slaves. So what was the life like for these people um, during this time period? Well, there were sort of two systems of labor. You had a task system. Slaves were ranked based on their ability to complete tasks. And um, if you did your tasks well and you did them fast, you would get sort of more rations, more food, or you could grow your own food on your free time. It freed you up if you got your work done to take care of your own family. Um, but plantations primarily used uh, gang labor where you were forced to work from sunrise to sunset because you needed to harvest as much cotton as humanly possible in that amount of time. So that was pretty brutal work. Um, additionally, you can see the tally of days work. Fast slaves would have more free time to go grow their own food and feed their own families. But gang labor um, had to be continuous. Children would be taken out into the fields. Nursing mothers would just tie their babies on their backs and bring them along. And as soon as they could toddle, they were expected to be picking up cotton as well. Overseers were typically impoverished white Southerners who couldn't own large pieces of property. And then you had drivers who were usually enslaved men who were um, entrusted with supervising their peers. So whites and blacks being forced to oversee slaves. Uh, typically women did domestic duties and domestic household work. They were kitchen workers, ladies maids and nannies. Um, this often necessitated literally a close proximity. Sometimes they would have bedrooms just off the children's bedrooms um, or off the kitchen so that they could be handy 24 hours a day for whatever their masters needed. What this perpetuated was a culture of rape um, where women uh, would be coerced or forced into sexual relations with white men. In fact, Thomas Jefferson um, had children with Sally Hemings, who was a, um, some called him his mistress. Others claim that that was a forced relationship. Um, and so Thomas Jefferson had African American children. She had sisters who had children fathered by white men. Her mother had fa children fathered by white men. So this was pretty common practice.
As for housing, slaves um, needed to be housed cheaply. Um, so many, many um, people would be crammed into these cabins um, and be given very little in the way of food and shelter. Um, they were just very basic. Uh, no running water, maybe a fireplace. This entire family would live in this one house. Um, and then they were responsible for their own meals and um, their own wash, etc. So conditions were pretty horrible. Cotton is king in the South. So as we have talked about before with the invention of the cotton gin, that fueled the need to grow more cotton and harvest more cotton so you could process more cotton, which then also fueled the Northern economy in the textile mills. And um, it literally becomes known as cotton, King Cotton or Cotton is King, as this quote from the Senator from North Carolina um, says, in all social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties, to perform the drudgery of life. It constitutes the very mudsill of society. He went on to utter those oft repeated words, you dare not make war on cotton. No power on earth dares make war upon cotton. Cotton is king. James Henry Hammond, Democratic governor of South Carolina and then US Senator of South Carolina. So farmers in the South started plowing up more and more land and pushing further and further west to gain more land that would be suitable for growing cotton. And here is the cotton gin separating the um, outer shell from the fuzzy stuff. Southern plantation owners owned large, um, ca had large cash crop farms. They didn't really farm anything else but that one cash crop. And you can see here how closely tied cotton production in this upper left-hand corner was tied to slavery. And you can see the, the slavery numbers down here are the darker orange colors. Um, so slavery was very much instrumental in growing those cotton. Uh, this doesn't mean that slaves didn't try to either sabotage their own work or escape. You didn't see a lot of rebellions because um, they would be put down so harshly and fiercely. There was a lot of fear of physical harm and even executions. So slaves tried to um, undermine the system in other ways, typically through sabotage of tools, slow work, etc. But you did have a growing underground railroad where slaves are attempting to escape primarily through states like Ohio to get into Canada where slavery was abolished. Harriet Tubman um, was the orchestrator of this and um, well-known abolitionist. You also have men like Frederick Douglass who um, give speeches that talk about um, how the slaves are treated and how unjust it is compared to for example, the Declaration of Independence. Um, slavery and um, this division in the country pushes us further and further apart. As we start to move further west, how are these states gonna come into the Union? Are they gonna be slave? Are they gonna be free? Do the people get to decide? So it becomes very politically divisive. Missouri, Texas, California, and Kansas were all entering the Union in the 18. 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the question of the balance of power in the House and the Senate was coming up as these states entered. Part of the Compromise of 1850 was that there would be a Fugitive Slave Act, which essentially said that um, bounty hunters could be used and that slaves could and should be returned to um, their owners. The Kansas-Nebraska Act led to bleeding Kansas. And then you have in 1857, the Dred Scott decision, which said that nowhere in the United States were blacks free, even in free states. So it's getting more and more divisive. Lincoln wins in 1860, the South secedes and war begins. He disliked slavery, but he believed that the constitution protected it where it existed. He talked about that we couldn't be half slave, half free, but um, he wasn't initially willing to force that issue. Um, seven states seceded immediately, uh, and all of their declarations cited slavery as the primary reasons why they left the Union. And once they create the Confederate states, slavery is legally recognized.